for the word. Okay, I won't be long. Second Samuel chapter 6. The title of my message is God is looking for a house to bless. God is looking for a house to bless. If we could all stand for the reading of the word. Second Samuel chapter 6. Look at your neighbor. Tell them God is looking for a house to bless. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, in verse 3, it says, So they set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, where it had been there for 20 years, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahil, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. They brought it out of the house, which was on the hill, accompanying the ark of God, and Ahil went before the ark. So then David and all the house of Israel played music before the Lord on all kinds of instruments of fir wood, harp, string instruments, tambourine, sistrums, and on cymbals. Now it says, when they came to Nacon's threshing floor, Uzzah put out his hand to the ark of God and took hold of it, for the oxen had stumbled. And this is the part. It says, then the anger of the Lord was aroused against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error. And he died there by the ark of God. So David became angry because of the Lord's outbreak against Uzzah. And he called on the place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of the Lord that day. And he said, how can the ark come to me? So David would not move the ark of the Lord with him into the city of David. But, now here it is. David took it aside into the house of Obed-Edom. Say it again. Say, God is looking for a house to bless. It says, the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all of his household. Father, bless your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, give your neighbor a high five and tell him, get ready to get blessed. You may be seated. The presence of the Lord is in this place. And the real secret of success, the real secret of victory, and even unusual exploits that always accompany the anointed servants of God. Do I got any servants of God here today? The secret of success to the servant of God is the fact that God's presence is always with them. That's the secret of success. Whatever it is that you believe God has called you to do, if you want to be successful, you need to have the presence of the Lord. My question is, where would we be without the presence of the Lord? The Bible says in Malachi, it says, test me in this, that I would not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out a blessing. Somebody say blessing. A blessing you could not contain. Understand me. The true riches of God cannot be kept in a bank account. The true riches of God cannot be put in a storehouse. The true riches of God cannot be hidden in a shoebox in a closet. Come on, ladies. The true riches, the true blessing of God, hear this, is the presence of God operating in power. That's the real blessing. See, the house of God is a place for miracles to happen. And the greats of God in the scripture all diligently, hear me, sought after the presence of God in their life. Every person in the Bible who was great. How many want to be great for God? How many want to be great for God? Well, you can't be great for God unless you're great with God. We need his presence. Even Moses cried out for the presence of God. In the book of Exodus, chapter 33, he says, Now, therefore, I pray if I have found grace in your sight, show me your ways that I may know you, that I might find grace with you. Consider this nation. And then God said to him, My presence will go with you. I will give you rest. And Moses said this, and this ought to be our prayer. If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from where we are at. I'll tell you, man. (laughs) <laughs> Once you've been in his presence, you'll know when you're not in it. Come on, somebody. Once you've experienced and tasted and seen that the Lord is good, you'll know when it's something else. 
See, even Israel's enemies sought after the presence of God when they stole the ark. They tried to strip Israel of its great strength. They stole the ark in battle with Israel because of King Saul. Imagine that God said to the people of Israel that if you'll seek my presence, I will give you great victory. He talked about it in Deuteronomy chapter 28. It says, all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of your Lord. Listen to what God said to Israel. This is what God is saying to many of us. He says, you shall be blessed in the city. You shall be blessed in the country. You shall be blessed in the fruit of your body. Come on. I mean, our bodies will be healed. The produce of your ground, the increase of your herds, the increase of your cattle, the offsprings of your flock. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall be you when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. Come on, I'm waiting on you to shout. Blessed shall you be when you come in. Blessed shall you be when you go out. And here's what he said. He said, the Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. In other words, you're not going to have to fight. God says, I'm going to fight for you. All the presence of the Lord is in this place. He says, and they shall go out and flee seven ways. Picture your haters fleeting, set, fleeing seven ways. Picture your critics fleeing seven ways. Come on, somebody. Picture your opponents that are trying to come against you, trying to frustrate you, trying to stop what God is. Guess what? When God shows up and his presence shows up, they can't hang out no more. They got to flee. Come on, somebody. You got to kick the devil out of your life. And imagine this great promise of his presence that King Saul, it says, and it has been documented, that he did not inquire of the Lord not once. Pastor Mark, he alluded to his daughter who despised David for dancing out of his clothes, but it really wasn't her fault. It was her dad's fault. That instead of inquiring of the Lord, he inquired of mediums. He went to tarot cards. He went to psychics. He went to the horoscope. You ain't saying that. See, it's quiet up in here. Imagine being the king of Israel and the Lord says, I will be with you if you obey my command. And Saul did not inquire of the Lord, not even once. I want to tell you something, church. The presence of God is important. We can't do anything without his presence. We can have a victory here and there, but how many want to have sustained victory? How many want to walk in constant power? Who wants to walk in constant favor and constant blessing and constant protection? It's the presence of the Lord. It's the blessing of the Lord that brings favor, that brings protection, that causes our enemies to flee seven different ways. That's why David, King David, when he became king, his first mission was to recapture the blessing. In, in 2 Samuel 6, he pushes the Philippines out of the territory, and then he recaptures the blessing. And that needs to be someone's first mission here this morning. <laughs> See, because the reason we're not winning is because something's missing. You might have money, but something's missing. You might have a relationship, but something's missing. You might have a good job, but something's missing. And you got to make your first mission to recapture the presence of the Lord. You've got to make it your first mission. Somebody say first mission. David's first mission was to fight for God's presence. Because the blessing of the Lord is real. The blessing of the Lord is necessary. The blessing of the Lord is possible when we choose his blessing. So here's David. And he goes after the ark that was at Abinadab's house for 20 years. And David goes and he gets it and he puts it on a new cart, the Bible says. And he's trucking it up to the city of David. He built a tent to put it in. He wanted to have the presence of the Lord there. But then the Bible says that God's anger was stirred against Uzzah when the cart failed. They had a pothole, and the ark began to slip, and Uzzah, with every good intention of heart, goes out to save the ark, but the presence of the Lord strikes him dead. Now, I know it's confusing to some. He said, what? 
He was trying to do a good thing. And what killed Uzzah was that he tried to do the right thing, but he did it the wrong way. Which stirred the anger of God towards David and towards Uzzah was that it was the Philistines who transported the ark by cart. And the Bible says that when the Philistines took the presence of the Lord to their camp and they put it in their temple next to their god, Dagon, Dagon, they put him there, and Dagon's this statue and this idol. You know, idols are dumb. They don't talk. They don't move. See, what makes idols powerful is when you animate them with your desires. But that's another sermon. You start talking football with them, and then they come alive. Well, I'll leave you alone this morning. And the Bible says that when they would go check on Dagon in the morning, he was positioned next to the ark, but he'd be tipped over. Come on now. And they did it a few times, and they'd put him back up. They'd go back in the morning, he'd be tipped over because nothing could stand. Sin can't stand. The devil can't stand in the presence of the living God. We need his presence. And the anger of the Lord was so stirred against the Philistines for stealing the ark and putting it on the car and mishandling his presence. See, God will send you his presence if you know how to handle it. But because they mishandled it, what happened was everybody got sick. He started afflicting the people to where the Philistines said, get this thing out of here. Put it in Abinadab's house. So here comes David and Uzzah with all the best intentions to get a hold of the presence of God, but they went about it the wrong way. And I want to talk to some of you who are hungry for God, but you don't know how to handle his presence. We must learn how to handle his presence. We need a generation that will know how to handle his presence. We need leaders that know how to handle his presence. Mm. See, what angers the Lord, hear me, and this is a strong point here, but I feel to preach it. What angers the Lord is when the church tries to create and fabricate and copy the world. The presence of the Lord is not in the light show. The presence of the Lord is not in the LED screens. The presence of the Lord is not in the coffee we serve in the cafe. It's strong, but it ain't the real anointing. The presence of the Lord cannot be copied. It cannot be fabricated. It cannot be worked up. It is not emotional. It's not even the music. The presence of the Lord is when the people of God allow the Holy Spirit to do what only he can do. It's when the people of God come before the Lord, not with pride, not acting like they got it all together, not acting like they got the best gifts in the house, not acting like they're the best preacher or the best leader or the best, but they come broken before the Lord. Like Pastor Jerome said, I just came out of prison. I was an alcoholic. I was a drunk. There are even some church kids in this place that you think you can fabricate the presence of the Lord, but God is looking for a new generation that will be broken of their pride. Broken. I'm going to leave you alone, but can anybody shout on this word this morning? See, the reason, whoo, you're going to love this point. The reason Uzzah was struck dead is because God wanted the ark to fall. He wanted them to know that they were doing it wrong. Oh, God, this is so good, Pastor Markey. And the reason the Lord struck Uzzah dead is because Uzzah got in the way of what God was trying to do. Oh, Lord, help us. Oh, Lord, help the leader that's trying to get in the way of what God is trying to do. Lord, help the pastor that's trying to get in the way of what God, because he says, I'm going to do what I got to do with you or without you. Come on, somebody. We got to learn how to handle the presence of God. If 
God's got to move you, he'll move you so that his power could break out. Come on and shout in this place. And everybody was afraid. Everybody was afraid. God says, if you want me, how many want the Lord? How many want the Lord? He says, and you got to learn how to handle me. Look at your neighbor and ask him, can you handle the blessing? Because he's looking for a house to bless. Can you handle the blessing? Because he's looking for a marriage to bless. He's looking for a family to bless. He, he's looking. The Bible says he took the ark aside and he parked it at the house of a man by the name of Obed-Edom. Now understand who Obed-Edom was, and I'm only going to be a few more minutes. Obed-Edom wasn't even a Jew. He was a Philistine. And when Saul was trying to kill David, David fled to the Philistine camp and he started acting crazy because he was afraid of dying. He didn't want to kill Saul because the Bible says, touch not the Lord's anointed. So he said, I'd rather go act crazy in the enemy's camp. But while he was there, he developed a following because how many anointed leaders always develop followings? And so when he went back to take the kingdom, all of these Philistines who he, developed, who, who he was hanging out with followed him wherever he went. So when he had this problem with the presence, he parked it at Obed-Edom's house. And what we find here, that while David was afraid, ooh, and the people of God were afraid of his presence, Obed-Edom was not afraid. Obed-Edom had an open heart. Ooh, Lord. I could picture David talking to Obed-Edom and all of his Philistine fathers when he was hanging out with the Philistines about all those shepherd field experiences. I could picture him talking to them about all those songs that the Lord gave him as he was watching. Come on, somebody. I could picture David talking to them about the goodness of God and talking about how faithful God is. Even telling them about the battle he had with Goliath and how God gave him favor. And I could picture Obed-Edom, come on, at the edge of his seat. Not back in church, all religious like some of us do. No, he, he said, come on, David, tell me more. There is more. I've never heard of this power. I've never heard of this God. If God can do it for you, I wonder if God could do it for me. If God could break you, come on. If God could break you through, I wonder if God, come on, if God could call you. Oh, God, if you know this God, I want to know this God too. How many of you have a hunger for God? So Obed, Edom opened up his heart to the presence of the Lord. Understand me, brothers, that the Lord wants to come in. In Revelation 3.20, he says, here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in. And I will eat with them. I will sup with them. You see, Obed, Edom had an open heart. The second thing is he had an open home. And I'm almost done. Your home never opens until your heart opens first. Your heart is the home for the Holy Spirit. A closed heart is a closed home, but an open heart is an open home. And what Obed-Edom actually did is he welcomed in the tangible presence of God into his home. Because the ark was representative of the worship of Israel. And the Lord said, wherever the ark is, there's going to be victory. It was the ark that parted the Jordan River when they came out of the wilderness and went into the promised land. The presence of the Lord was on the ark. And when Obed-Edom opened up his heart, he opened up his home and he brought in the presence of God into his home home. Brothers and sisters, don't you understand the power of God's presence in your home? I'll tell you, man, I've been married a long time. I've raised four kids, put them all through the same elementary, all through the same middle school, all through the same high school. Riz is the last one. She'll be graduating this year. 
Yeah. That's right. Clap for me and Georgina. Clap for us because we did, we did that. And more her. She more did that. And I could tell you something about our home. We don't have a perfect home. You don't? No. But the presence of God is in our home. And if you want to have a successful home, you don't need a perfect home. You just need his presence in your home. Come on, who can clap in this place? Fight to keep the presence See, when you come to church, you don't come to get his presence. You come to bring the presence that's already in your home. And the same anointing that's here is the same anointing that could be there. Obed-Edom opened his heart, and then he opened up his home to the ark of God. And when he brought the ark, listen to me, you're going to love this. He not only brought in the ark, but he brought in everything that was in the ark. Do you understand that there was a lid on that thing? You had the mercy seat on top, because I mean, no, mercy is always on top. The Shekinah glory, they would sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat for the forgiveness of the people. Somebody say mercy. mercy. So what did he bring into his home? He didn't just bring in an ark, he brought in mercy. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Where is the mercy, Mr. Percy? Then they opened up the lid, right, Pastor Joe? And they had the pot with the manna. And the matter represents the provision of God. See, when we bring in the ark, we don't just bring in the mercy. Woo! We bring in the provision. My boss is not my provider. Come on, somebody. The government is not my provider. It's God who puts manna in the bowl. It's God who brings home the bacon. It's God who puts bread on the table. It's God that provides. He's the guy. I may not have everything I want, but man, I got everything that I need. Somebody shout in this place. It wasn't just the ark. It's what was in the ark. The bowl with the manna. What about Aaron's rod? God gave Moses a rod, and he gave Aaron a rod. And they went to Pharaoh. He told Aaron, you, you throw that rod down in front of Pharaoh. When his sorcerers come out, you throw that rod down, and stuff's going to happen. <laughs> when we bring God's presence in, brothers and sisters, we don't just bring in the mercy. We don't just bring in the provision. What we say, uh-oh, oh, here, guess what? Stuff's going to happen. Yeah. Miracles don't just, have, don't just have to happen at this altar. Miracles can happen in your living room. He's looking for a house to bless. Miracles could happen in your kid's bedroom. Miracles could happen in your backyard. Come on, somebody. See, when we say we're a house of miracles, we're not just talking about God's house. We're talking about your house, too. Aaron's rod budded, and almonds came out. Things happened. Someone say, things happened. Happen. Strange things happened. Great things happened. Supernatural things happened. When you bring in the presence of God, anything can happen. Those almonds represented new things. Woo! Those almonds represented new fruit. New life, new dreams. New, see, God's not done with you yet. I said the Lord is not done. Come on, somebody. Just bring in his presence, and you bring in his mercy. You bring in his provision, and you bring in his power where anything can happen. What else was in the ark? The law. The stone tablets, the Ten Commandments. Some of you have them posted on your wall at home. Good. You should. Because that's the standard. Woo. Oh, but Edom just didn't bring in the mercy and bring in the provision and bring in the supernatural. But he brought in a new standard. Something happens when a couple... 
Pastor, I said to you a few weeks ago, someone quoted it to me this week. I said, Pastor, I love what you said, that if you don't like what you're building, start over. I was talking about marriage, wasn't I? Missional marriage. I said, if you don't like what you've built, I don't care if you've been married 20 years. Here's the good news. You get to start over. But this time when you start over, start over with the right standard. He brought in the ark. He brought in the mercy. He brought in the provision. He brought in Aaron's staff, which was the miracles, anything that happened. And then he brought in the standard. Someone say the standard. It's time we raise the standard. It's time we tell those kids on Sunday, we don't stay home. I don't care if you're on TikTok or YouTube all night. Get your little behind up, and we're going to the house of God. Come on, help me preach a little bit. I'm having a good time. I don't care who you got to text and FaceTime with, and you were up all night burning the midnight oil. Don't you understand? As for me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. You may not like the preaching. You may not like the music, but guess what? You're still going to go because if you live in my house, it's God's rules, and it's my rules. Bring back the standard. Everybody comes to church. Well, I'm just living here renting. Guess what? Renters go to church too. Put it in the lease. By the way, on Sunday, nobody stays home. You don't got to go to my church, but you got to go to a church. What about tithing? What about keeping the Lord first? Come on, somebody. Because how many know when you make God first, the rest is blessed? <laughs> keeping him first in your worship. Keeping him first in your devotion. I think when we get up in the morning, the first thing we ought to do is fire up that worship music. You could do it simultaneously. Just fire up the Keurig and the worship music at the same time. <laughs> when I go downstairs... I got Amazon here, I got Alexa right here, and I got Keurig right here, and I hit the button, and I said, Alexa, play worship. Because the beginning of my day belongs to the Lord. The beginning of my, come on somebody, shout if you know what I'm talking about. The beginning of my day belongs to Jesus. Lord, show up so heavy at home that I don't got to go to work today. That's a blessing. Come on, somebody. I can't go in because I got arrested by the Holy Ghost. And I can't leave this place. And if you fire me, that's all right. The Lord will give me another job. Because I'd rather be in his presence. Because in his presence is the fullness of joy. In the presence is mercy. In the presence he is my provider. In his presence. Hey, we need his presence. looking for a house to bless. Stay close. He's looking for a house to bless. How about your house? How about your house? Why can't he bless your house? Why can't he show up in your house? Why can't there be prayer meetings at your house? Why can't there be house fires at your house? Why can't there be blessing at your house? Why can't there be healing at your house? Why can't there be breakthrough at your house? Why can't your children catch the Holy Ghost at your house? Come on. Why can't there be worship in your house? I'm going to keep preaching until you just catch a hold of this word. Why can't there be worship? Why can't there be financial increase? He's looking for a house to bless. He's looking for a family to bless. He's looking to do something mighty. Touch your neighbor and tell him his presence is real. Touch your second choice and tell him anything can happen. See, the presence of the Lord opened up his heart. Hear me. Opened up his home. But here's the final point, and I'm going to send you home on this. It changed and opened up his heritage. you study, because they said the ark is at Obed-Edom's house 90 days. Someone say 90 days. And let me tell you what happened when the presence of God got into Obed-Edom's house. It got crazy up in there. In a good, in a good kind of crazy. In a good way. Someone say a good way. It was crazy. Stuff started happening. And they said, the Lord is, they went to there and said, the Lord is blessing this man. Rabbinical literature says that instead of being afraid of the ark, Pastor Jerome, Obed-Edom would get in the morning and burn a candle 
in front of the ark. It would burn all day, and then when it went out at night, he'd come and bring a new candle in honoring the ark, honoring the presence of the Lord. And when he did that, according to rabbinical literature, the ark started moving. And they said, the blessing of the Lord is on Obed-Edom's house, David. Now, what was the blessing? For Obed-Edom, the blessing came in the form of children. And if you study it, I, I looked it up. Rabbinical literature says that while the ark was at his house, his wife and eight daughters, daughter-in-laws, he had eight sons. His wife and his eight daughter-in-laws all bore children. And me and Georgina were talking about that. I go, listen to this. This is heavy, but because there's two accounts. It says they all bore children twice every month during the three months the ark remained with him. But to an, according to another version, which actually kind of makes more sense. Watch this. You're going to... Get ready, your mind's going to explode. That in the three months that the ark was there, every one of his daughter-in-laws had six children. Sep, how do you say, septuplets. find it curious that when the presence of God showed up in our church how many young women started getting pregnant I don't know I'm just throwing that out there I just found it I know how that happens okay I know that happened cover your ears some of you young people I know how that happens but I'm not talking about that I'm talking about miracle children Come on and help me stir up faith in this place. I'm talking about girls that couldn't have babies, that tried everything, but because of the presence of the Lord, because they opened their heart to the presence. Come on, somebody. I'm getting excited, and I'm not even a woman. Come on, somebody. Because they opened up their heart and they opened up their home, God began to lift up and raise up their heritage because the Bible says that children are a heritage of the Lord. His presence is powerful. It's necessary. It's real. Someone say, it's real. And when David finally came, hear me. I'm going to close with this. Did you get something today? I hope we hunger for his presence. I hope the next time we get together that the level of anointing in these services just goes a little higher. Who wants to just go higher and higher and higher and deeper and deeper and move stronger. Who wants to move stronger in the presence of the Lord? David comes to, he hears Obed's getting blessed. He's like, this guy's getting blessed. I got to go get that thing. Did a little homework on the way. And he realized, okay, we can't put it on a cart. The Levites carry the ark. So he had to go get reorganized. And we thank God for our worship team. They carry the presence of the Lord. And he got them all the years. Let's go get it. And the Bible says this in Chronicles. That when he took the ark up to the city of David, once again, rabbinical literature says that Obed-Edom moved. He didn't stay in his house. He sold it. He rented it out. He's like, you can have it, bro. I'm going with the ark. He packed up, what's her name, Kate plus eight. What's her name, Kate plus eight, all her kids. All you daughter-in-laws get all these babies. That's a lot of strollers. I don't know what kind of stroller. Do all them kids in the stroller. We're not staying here. We're going with the presence of God because the blessing of the Lord. Come on. He multiplies us. He grows us. He builds us. He expands us. 
God not only changed, the presence of God not only changed his heart, his home, his heritage, but it changed his whole identity. If you study the scripture in 2 Samuel, it calls him a Gittite, a Philistine. But if you read about Obed-Edom in Chronicles, it chronicles him as a Levite. How many know if it was not for the blood of Jesus? Come on, how many know if it was not for the presence of the Lord, we'd still be a gang member. We'd still be an ex-prisoner. We'd still be a gossip. We'd still be a womanizer. We'd still be a manizer. But how many are grateful that the presence of the living God changed our whole identity? Oh, I think you ought to clap and shout. I feel a praise coming on this morning. I feel like there's a praise. I feel like we can rejoice over revelation. We can rejoice over what the Lord, how many say it was the presence of the Lord that changed my life. And all 60 plus of them went with David and they just go hang out. The Lord raised them up. Woo. God always raises somebody up who's familiar with his presence. And the Bible tells us that all his children were put in a place of authority. In fact, in Chronicles, it talks about all his sons, right? And it talks about the oldest son and his six sons. And that's just one of the kids. He says, and they were given the southern gate. Different people were given charge of the entry points, and they were given the southern gate. Other literature says that his children, his grandchildren, were given charge of the storehouse, the Bank of Israel. Oh, my God. I don't know if you, I don't, I, this gets me excited. That when you host the presence of God, there's no limit to what God can do in your house. He's looking for a house to bless. I said he's looking for a house to bless. He's looking for a family to bless. He's looking for, who wants to see that blessing on your children and on your children's children? 